Welcome once again to North Shore Fellowship. We're coming to you from Christ Church in Fairhaven, and this is our location for our nine o'clock service for North Shore Fellowship. And I'm so thrilled to be here. I'm so thrilled to worship with you on this Sunday morning of Resurrection Sunday, Easter as you may call it. And yes, he is our living hope. And that's why we're here, because we have that living hope, because Jesus did not stay dead, he rose from the dead. And we're celebrating Resurrection Sunday. You can call it Easter if you like. Jesus rose after being crucified and then spending three days in a locked tomb with a massive boulder in front of it. And he came forth with power, with life, with victory over the grave. Now Jesus' death and his resurrection, the two things that we're celebrating this weekend, are of vital importance. I would say the most important events, not just in Jesus' life, but in human history, the things that were accomplished. In fact, that's why he came. He came to die. He came to rise again. And the natural world and the spiritual world has not been the same since. So we're going to look at scripture and some scriptures that you're obviously familiar with and you're expecting here on this morning, on this special morning. But I want you to just have fresh eyes, fresh ears, and allow the scripture to speak to you about the significance and the impact of the resurrection. Matthew 28 starts out this way. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from his heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were like white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became boom like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has risen just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has risen from the dead and he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the woman hurried from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell the disciples. Suddenly, <laughs> Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him. They clasped his feet and they worshipped him. And then Jesus said, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers and go to Galilee. There they will see me. Amazing. Amazing. They came to the tomb, maybe to decorate the outside, maybe just to pay homage and to give their respect, maybe just because they missed Jesus so much. An angel rolls the stone away. The tomb is empty, but Jesus is right outside presenting himself to them, no longer dead, but alive. Jesus has risen from the dead. Whew. It wasn't just somebody coming back to life. The world was changed, and it would never be the same again, the natural world and the spiritual world. You know, so today, millions of churches around the planet, right now and throughout the day and preceding this hour in different time zones, are celebrating this event. They're celebrating with the same scriptures, a lot of the same songs, talking about the same thing. And now, I'm not sure if we can fully appreciate what happened in that moment because we didn't live prior to Jesus birth we didn't live prior to his death and resurrection but some people did and the earth was filled with such deep darkness of death it permeated it covered the earth and when Jesus rose from the dead something snapped something happened here on earth that transformed everything you see until that moment there was just hopelessness darkness death was had dominion over the earth. But when Jesus rose, the curse was broken. Romans 6, 9 says it this way, Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, and death no longer has dominion. Death no longer has dominion. The world went from hopeless darkness to what we just sang about, living hope, living hope. The resurrection is central to what we believe as Christians. Now, there's a lot of things that we believe and are important, and they're very important. I love Christmas. I love the story of the virgin birth and Jesus being born in Bethlehem and laid in a manger and the shepherds coming and the angels heralding, and that's important. But despite that miracle of Jesus' birth, it's not as important. And the enormous significance of the crucifixion is extremely important. And I wouldn't say it's not as important as much as it all makes sense it all comes into fruition because of the resurrection 
Now I'll explain myself. The resurrection, if it didn't happen, Jesus' birth, it would not have meant what it does now. His death would not have meant what it does now. You see, even if Jesus had lived the life he lived, wonderful teachings, showed us God's love, and then died on the cross and never rose from the dead? Now think about it. If he never rose from the dead, well, we could say that he was a very great man, maybe the greatest man that ever lived. Jesus, he did incredible things. One of the things he didn't do, though, is fulfill his promise that he said he was going to die, suffer and die, and then rise from the dead. And if he didn't do that, he just would have got one wrong, one big one wrong. But his life would have been wonderful. You know, he would have had followers. And maybe, I'm just conjecturing here, maybe they would have like made excuses. Well, Jesus said, you know, not literally that he'd rise from the dead, but spiritually. Or maybe they would have said, you know, well, it wasn't an a immediate rise from the dead. Maybe thousands of years later he'll rise from the dead. No, I really believe that Jesus was very literal when he said, I will rise from the dead in three days. Now, when I present the gospel to non-believers, you know, to skeptics, <laughs> and I do like to debate and talk about the truth of the gospel because I'm firmly, I firmly believe it. But this one fact always confounds people. When I say that Jesus died and actually rose from the dead, he actually came back to life, they don't want to take it any further. They, they feel like that's preposterous to the logical mind. The skeptic will say, you know, maybe he never really fully died on the cross. Yeah, you ever think about that? Maybe his body didn't really give up the ghost. <laughs> or maybe, this is a popular one, the apostles stole Jesus' body and then claimed that they saw him afterwards, but never did. Or maybe someone else, an imposter that looked like Jesus, took his place and, and just, you know, assumed Jesus' cult following. And No, no, no. Jesus died and he rose from the dead and if he never rose from the dead if any of those skeptic conjectures are true if the story was false then everything we believe would just crumble into nothing it really would because it's pinnacle it's of utmost importance that we believe that jesus rose from the dead now i have a question if he never rose from the dead if the resurrection story was false, would it still make sense to follow Jesus in the modern age? You know, well, you could think about it. Well, as a lifestyle alone, Christianity is actually a good lifestyle. It gives good moral foundation for civilizations. It teaches ethics and morality and usually keeps us from, you know, killing one another, usually. It actually encourages love. It encourages acts of charity. So Christianity as an ideal, it holds up. But if the whole literal resurrection thing is not true, as some people who call themselves Christians might even doubt, then what Paul tells us about our faith and about us in general as believers in Jesus, that we're useless and we're pitiful. <laughs> How would you like to be known as useless and pitiful? Well, you are useless and you are pitiful if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Let me explain. Paul. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 14, he says, If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. He goes on five verses later, 1 Corinthians 15, 19, We are more to be pitied than anyone in the world if the resurrection never happened. You see, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, our faith just falls apart, falls completely apart. And that's why I believe that that fact is attacked and it is scrutinized and it is sometimes even maligned. You know, the information age has given birth to wonderful resources of data and information and facts and false facts. <laughs> and there's many theories and there's many conjecture. And, it, and some of it has to do with Bible knowledge and, and Bible truth claims. You know, and there's a renewed skepticism on the part of atheists and others that are questioning whether the Bible's true, whether the stories in it are true, whether Jesus ever existed, or even if the things that the Bible said he did ever really happened. And we hear this doubt coming forth. In fact, there was a very notable one uh, by the name of Lee Strobel, a very notable atheist. He was the legal editor of the Chicago Tribune. And he, he actually documents this in a, in a book he wrote later called Case for Christ. 
And he began as an atheist, and what he wanted to do is set out to disprove everything that he could about Jesus. He wanted to attack the truths and really make them hold up on their own merit. And his pursuit to sort of disprove facts about Jesus backfired. It backfired. As he discovered the historicity and the veracity of the truth claims, he ended up becoming a stronger believer than anyone he knew, and he was writing books about his journey. In his book called The Case for the Real Jesus, he addresses what were the attacks on the veracity of the New Testament with regard to Jesus, particularly Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection. In other words, looking at those two events and saying, okay, how can we disprove them? In the modern age, we have all the logic, we have all the information, now let's just go right after those two things, Jesus' death and particularly Jesus' resurrection, and then let's try to disprove it. And then he realizes that when he's weighing evidence of history, literal history, that there's criteria that everyone uses. And when you measure the criteria that's used to prove not only Jesus' existence, but his death and his resurrection, it far outweighs the criteria that we use to prove other historical uh, characters. You see, there's more reliable accounts, and that means an eyewitness, that means independent sources who wrote during a contemporary time that the person lived. There's more reliable accounts of Jesus, including his life, his death, and his resurrection, than there are for people like Julius Caesar, or Alexander the Great, or other un people that undoubtedly existed and changed history, but they just don't have enough proof, or as much proof, as Jesus did. Not just his existence, remember, but his resurrection. Wow, you could look that up yourself. The Apostle Paul had a similar story. He was someone that didn't believe that Jesus was Messiah, and he set out to try to destroy him and his followers. And he began as a highly educated, very accomplished religious leader, a Pharisee, a Hebrew of Hebrews, he calls himself. He studied under Gamaliel, who, who was one of the chief rabbi, rabbinical scribes of that era, and still is quoted today in, uh, in, the, in the Talmud, and the Haggadah, really, the uh, Passover book that we use. And he's this is Saul of Tarsus, proud, educated, accomplished. And he set out to disprove any factual claim about Jesus, his death, his resurrection, followers, Messiah, all that stuff. And I remember, he's not an eyewitness to the death. He came after Jesus was already resurrected and ascended. So he wasn't a believer during this time. Yet, something happened to his heart. He came face to face with Jesus on the road to Damascus. He listened to the accounts that he heard from those that were with him. And he listened and he read and he believed. He heard about it and he completely turned away from his comfortable, safe life as a Pharisee and a religious leader. And he put himself in a very compromised position where now all the leaders of the world hate him, the religious leaders, the Jews, the Romans, because he absolutely believed that Jesus was who he said he was. And he was beaten, and he was imprisoned, and he was eventually decapitated. Why? Because he believed the truth of what you and I believe today. That this man, Jesus, who he didn't walk with, was born of a virgin. He died on a cross. He rose from the dead, and he was willing to go to his death to believe what others called a myth. You know, his experience... It wasn't just academic. It wasn't just being convinced. He came face to face with the living God. He was filled with the Spirit of God. He writes this in Romans 8, 11. He said, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus from the dead, and all these scriptures have to do with what we call Easter, being, Jesus being raised from the dead, he'll give life to your mortal bodies. And this, by the same spirit living within you. <laughs> Paul had the spirit of Jesus living with him. You see, the resurrection and the proof of the resurrection didn't just cause Paul to switch religions, to change lanes. No, no, he was given life by the, by the spirit of God. And that's the spirit of God that lives in us, the same spirit that raised from the dead. He was a mean-spirited, you know, Pharisee, he became a kind-hearted believer and, and leader in the church. He was pride-centered, he became Christ-centered. That's what happens when the Spirit of God gets a hold of you. He was selfish, and then he became sacrificial. 
He was led by evil to do awful things, and then he became filled with the Spirit to do great things. He went from executing Christians for blasphemy to being the principal writer of the New Testament, which we base most of our Christian doctrine on today. He stopped enforcing the kill for blasphemy, and he started writing things like, love is patient, love is kind. And he believed that Jesus died and rose from the dead. He who was there, he who was an authority on Judaism, authority on the Roman history of of the first century, he believed so much that he committed his whole life and he died for it. The Apostle Peter believed as well, but he was a different type completely than Paul. See, other than the fact that they were both Jewish, they didn't have much in common. Peter was a common fisherman. He was no scholar. He met Jesus while he was fishing in Galilee. And when he received the Holy Spirit, he was transformed. By the time Pentecost comes around, he had become, he was once an uneducated, inarticulate commoner, and now he is the most prominent teacher, leader, speaker of the early church of the first half of the book of Acts. Peter, this common fisherman, transformed. And he himself wrote what we just quoted about the living hope in that song before he died and remembered something. He was crucified upside down. He, was cruci- he went to his death because he would not redact his belief in these what skeptics call preposterous claims about Jesus rising from the dead. And one of the things he wrote before he died was 1 Peter 1.3. And it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into the living hope. Through what? Through what? Through the very thing that we're celebrating today, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Living hope through the resurrection of Jesus. That's why this day is so important. That's why we are so excited to celebrate it, regardless of what's going on in the world. That living hope is the hope of glory. We experience it here on earth. Yes, we have this great hope. And it continues into eternity when we die. You see, when we die, our living hope doesn't die. It just becomes the hope of glory. And we receive this, we just read it, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why the resurrection is so important. The living hope, it gives us hope in any circumstances, regardless of what we face. Now, you know, we know that heaven is promised to us when we die, and that's beautiful. But what about what we're facing today? What about the terrible things that we're facing today? And I want to tell you, regardless of what we're experiencing today, Because of the resurrection, we have living hope. We can face it. Living hope is different than regular hope. Hope is a good thing. I love to be a hopeful person. But hope could be defined as basically, you know, optimistic aspirations. I'm anticipating that something good's gonna happen. I have hope, but living hope. (laughs) Living hope is the confident expectation of what God has promised. The confident expectation that you will receive what God has promised, that his word is true. Living hope, that means, means that we have strength in our weakness. It, it means we have encouragement even in the darkest of times. We have victory that goes beyond the grave. We have deep joy, even, we even have happiness. As we'll see in a later scripture, despite the tough struggles that we have here in this world. Jesus said in John 16, 33, it says, these things I've spoken to you, that in me you, ha- you might have peace. Now, in the world, he warns, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. What's cheer? Happiness. Be happy, because I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. Jesus promised that we'll have tribulations, and some of us feel like we have tribulations today, and let's be honest, we do have tribulations in the season that we're living in. It's like no other Easter I've ever experienced. What are tribulations? Well, it's trouble. It's hardship. It's suffering. And I know that many of you are having trouble and hardship and suffering today. I feel this. I feel this. You know, my life is not always marked with just easy, pleasant circumstances. (laughs) In fact, many times it's not that way. And as I look back on this past year, it's been a tough year. 
It's been a tough year for many of you. Uh, it's been a tough year for me. I've seen many friends and loved ones pass away. I was just thinking of my young Thomas, my young nephew Thomas. Young, vivacious, energetic, full of life, but overdosed on Oxycontin only five months ago. And so we suffer his loss. Lost. And many of you have had to say goodbye to dear friends and loved ones, even this terrible week, this terrible month that we're in, this terrible pandemic that we're in. I know last year on Easter, I spoke about the living hope, and I was just pointing out certain people that I see just have the living hope in spite of tough circumstances in their life, regardless of deep hardships that they face. They, they have the living hope. And one of them that I pointed out was our dear friend Joy Vanderhoof. And Joy, one of the most faithful friends and congregants any pastor could have. I mean, I'm telling you, she's the most active volunteer, the biggest supporter, always encouraging, always serving, always helping, the first to arrive and the last to leave at every church event. And when I met her, she was kind of a, a lonely person. You know, she had very few family members to begin with. And then in a short period of time, as I said uh, in one of my sermons, they all died, including her mom and her husband. And she had no spouse, no parents, no siblings, no children, and she was devastated. Yet, what she did, she came out of darkness into the marvelous light, completely trusting God, and God filled her with the living hope, the living hope. So now she's radiating with deep joy and fulfillment and contentment and feelings that you don't commonly see in many people. But then less than four months after I mentioned that in that sermon, I shockingly watched her slip into eternity in a hospital room where she and I, I just came to visit her and pray for her. And she suddenly slipped away and died. And I questioned, why, God? Why would you take her? At this point in her life, she's fulfilling the, I mean, the, she's at the highest point that she says in her life, fulfillment, joy, victory, strength, encouragement, and then boom, slips into eternity. She gets sick suddenly and just dies. And then it occurred to me that what she was experiencing here on earth, as good as it was, really even as great as it was, was nothing compared to eternity. What she is experiencing now is even better. If she had the living hope, now she has the hope of glory. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says this, What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, no human mind has conceived the things God prepares for those who love him. You see, the living hope is that, that we have this wonderful relationship with God here on earth. He helps us through the toughest of times, but that's just the beginning. The hope of glory, glorification, is the final reward. And friends, we have to keep our minds on the hope of glory. We have to keep our minds on the fact that what we're experiencing now is temporary. You know, when I first became a pastor and we got our first building, it was actually, we were, we were uh, renovating an eight-plex movie theater in Franklin, Tennessee. It was really cool. And it took a lot of work. So during the time that we were renovating it, the whole place was gutted, so our offices couldn't be there. So we rented a construction trailer to put right outside the building during the construction site. Anybody ever seen a construction trailer? They just, you know, there's like a modest trailer that has tight little offices in it, and it's usually at some construction site. And that was exactly what it was. And so since our offices wouldn't be ready for a month, uh, all of us, all four of my staff were in there. Now, it was small, it was crowded, it was cluttered. <laughs> And it was placed outside the building in a construction area, in a muddy construction area, so the carpets were always filthy. Uh, and it, it always seemed dirty and ugly, but you know, I knew it was temporary. And it always seemed unlevel, too. I remember sitting at my desk and saying to my coworkers, Aren't, isn't this kind of unlevel? And then as days go by, it gets smellier and smellier and moldier and molder. And, and we're working out of this space and the saving grace, the only thing that kept us sane, as you know it, is that it was temporary. It was temporary. 
There was a big, beautiful, wonderful auditorium being built for us with great office spaces right where we were, and it was temporary. And guys, that's how this life is for us. It's just a construction trailer outside of a wonderful place that's being prepared for you and I, and that our friend Joy is already experiencing. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may also be. That is the hope of glory. And right now, the whole world is experiencing tribulation. It's not just isolated to one part. It seems like the whole world is experiencing this tribulation. And some of us are holding on to hope. We're all holding on to hope that this is just temporary. You know, soon things will get back to some type of relative normalcy, please. But I tell you, even regular life, even things getting back to as close to what we call normal is also temporary. We're created for eternity. So nothing that we cling to in this life will last, only that which is eternal. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18 says this, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are unseen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. God, give us the ability to see things as you see them, to see the eternal. Things that seem important to our, our lifestyle now, things that really have us kind of frustrated, been stripped away, things that are important to us. What's important to you? Time with your extended family, you're not getting that right now. You know, jobs and job security, things are a mess. What about financial security? <laughs> look at the markets, look at our retirement savings, look at whatever you have invested. Music, sporting again, uh, events, they're just not happening. Travel and vacations, it seems impossible. Even church gatherings. As I'm speaking to you today, I'm in front of t a bunch of empty seats in a church, and it won't be filled for quite some time. And then beyond that, in addition to that, we're hearing these grave reports around the world about people dying alone, which just seems awful. Or watching their loved ones get sick and, and knowing what's to come. Or those we love and having friends of friends report regularly about the deaths of loved ones. It's tough. I've heard of more deaths this month, I think, of people I know than any month in my life. And the month is not even half over yet. Whew. But I want to tell you something. I have not lost hope. I've actually gained it. I'm not, falling into, I'm not falling into despair. You know, I'm actually eagerly awaiting each day to see what God's going to do with hopeful anticipation. I am surrounded by people who feel the same way. I've talked to people who have their faith in God, and all of them are, have faith in his promises, have this hopeful expectancy that something is going to happen, that God will take care of us. And even if he doesn't, as we saw the boys in the book of Daniel, even if he doesn't save us, we have the hope of glory, eternity waiting for us. But why do I have this optimism? Why do I feel like things are good right now? I want to tell you, well, you might be questioning me. Uh, are we just foolish? Why are we so optimistic? Are we naive? Are we just brainwashed? Are we in denial? Are we just covering up our deep-seated fear Believing in some fairy tales and false truths, is that what is keeping us sane and hopeful and faithful? No. No, it's because we trust in the Lord. We trust in the ever, everlasting truth of God's word. We trust that regardless of what we face, he's with us and he'll never leave us and he'll never forsake us. We trust that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in us because of what we just read previously, because of the resurrection, because of what we're celebrating today. And because of the resurrection, once again, that's Jesus being raised from the dead. Because of the resurrection, we have the living hope for the hope of glory. And that is not just for this lifetime. It's for eternity. Let me close with this piece of scripture that I alluded to before, I read part of. But listen to this. Let this sink into your hearts. This is from 1 Peter 1, 
And I believe it's the word of God for you on this resurrection morning. Let us thank the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was through his loving kindness that we were born again to a new life and have a hope that never dies. This living hope is ours because Jesus was raised from the dead. We will receive the great things that we have been promised. They are being kept safe in heaven for us. They are pure and will not pass away. They will never be lost. You are being kept by the power of God because you put your trust in him and you will be saved from the punishment of sin at the end of the world. And listen to this final verse. With this hope, you can be happy. Even if you need to have sorrow and all kinds of tests, and that includes tribulations, for a while. Friends, that's my prayer. My prayer for you is that you experience the living hope that never dies So like we just read, you can be happy in this life, the life to come, because of the resurrection, because of the hope of glory, because of the living hope. God bless you. Have a wonderful resurrection day.